welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley. Mark, what do we got going on today? How are you doing? Well, you know, it's uh, sad and, and really insightful, I guess, this morning. You know, we had a last night, we, we've had a, a vendor. He's kind of, you know, at uh, IRS would probably call him an employee, but he's been a 1099 guy for the last uh, 10, 12 years around GC when we were doing rehabs. And he got COVID uh, a few months ago and it turned into pneumonia. And, and he actually passed away last night. And uh, it, it, it's just a very sad day for us here at GC. And, uh, it, it kind of puts in perspective, you know, we've been running around with a bunch of problems around here, or not really problems, just bigger things we have to solve. And uh, uh, it just kind of puts life in perspective about what we're here for. And, and you know, we had uh, um, Gary Davidson on a few episodes ago, and we talked about the whole uh, giving mentality. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, you know, we're all probably here to make money, but at the end of the day, that, that is probably the least of everything. And, uh, the whole, uh, purpose and, and helping people and, and giving back it leads to making money, but I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm having an insightful, uh, morning, I guess here. So. Yeah, man, we're going deeper than usual here. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So Gary Davidson episode 79, 80, somewhere in that range, I believe, but I love that. Like wake up with the intention of how do I provide value to others? Pick five people, right? And if you can provide value to them and be purposeful about it and not keep score, like that will, don't worry about what it'll return to you, but it will return. I can, I can tell you that. I can tell you that from experience. Like the yeah. biggest, the biggest thing in our business right now is the people we have involved and it's the value we've provided that has, that has elevated us from where we were a year ago, two years ago. So, yeah, I yeah, know there's just more to, more to life than money. Um, and the money will come if you do the right things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Like when, 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 you, when, you, when you're all said and done, what are people going to say about you? You die twice. You die physically and then you die when everyone stops talking about you. Right. And we all have a million things going on in our own life, but, and you focus on your own, your, your own stuff. But man, like put this is the, this is your public service announcement to, <laughs> to live with a purpose here. Yeah. So good, it started good. nice and deep. Woo. Yep. Yep. <laughs> let's, let's come back off. Let's what's the housing provider tip of the week. Oh, my housing provider tip uh, just sounds very cold compared to what we just talked about, but, it, uh, <laughs> and then no play on words. Cause I'm going to talk about, uh, HVAC cleaning and the fall coming up here. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we, we always look at our numbers here at GC and, you know, looking at our, uh, HVAC or call it our furnace, uh, maintenance last year, we had a large percentage of properties that we brought on that you know didn't go through the fall months that were a majority of our work orders uh, when it came to no heat calls or, or issues around the thermostat or bad thermostats. So uh, you know, make sure you know for us, you know, we, we couldn't avoid some of that because we didn't manage the property last August, September when we started doing our cleaning checks. But just keep that in mind that that hundred or hundred fifty bucks you spend to get that cleaning check done for your furnace or get your boiler kind of tuned up and it'll save you a lot of money and a lot of frustration on your tenant side um on the back end so make sure you're, you're doing your your maintenance on your your hvac system as we go into fall i like it we got a good one today this is this is definitely a different spin than we're used to yeah no for sure um we have uh you, you know we, we're gonna talk about an area we haven't talked about uh uh and we're going to talk about uh, uh, house hacking, um, almost from a very ground level, um, strategic, uh, and maybe even some strategic breakdown uh, standpoint here. So, uh, cool. on today's episode, uh, you know, we have uh, a house hacker that uh, bought a four flat, and he's gonna. We're gonna take him through the entire uh, kind of process, his mindset of why he chose that neighborhood, and uh, and we're just gonna kind of take it uh, step by step here, and and, and really. Uh, draw out some of this information that, uh, that, uh, he can give us, um, that will help all you house hackers that are looking to get started here. So, all right, we're excited without further ado, we want to introduce, uh, Joseph Pochinskis, a uh, very Chicago sounding name even. I, I love it. So, uh, w welcome to the show. Uh, you know, we're going to just dive right in here. So give us, you know, we usually don't go too deep, but give us a little background. You're born and raised in Chicago or give us a little kind of how you got into, uh, buying this, this property. Yeah, so um, I'm from the southwest suburbs, Midlothian, Illinois. Um, I went to school at the University of Kentucky. Um, I majored in agricultural economics. Um, I got a job in a meat cutting plant on the south side of Chicago, which brought me, you know, close to Canaryville, close to Bridgeport, 
kind of fell in love with the area. Um, it's kind of rough and gritty, um, but charming in, in a way. Um, <clears throat> I did what every college kid was told to do, where I moved back at home, paid off my student loans, paid off my car. Um, I got out of debt and then I moved to Bridgeport. Um, so I moved to a, an apartment in Bridgeport in November of 2019. And then three months later, COVID hits, you know, and um, from there, I found out really quick that renting, I, I didn't want to rent anymore. I'm paying $2,000 a month in rent. Um, and I also don't want to go live back at home anymore, you know? Um, and I'm also sitting in this beautiful apartment in the middle of COVID, um, basically just burning money, you know, everything's closed and, and I'm trying to find a way to creatively get out of the rat race. Um, so then I stumbled upon bigger pockets, um, listened to a couple of their episodes and it kind of came clear to me that I, I wanted to get into real estate and I wanted to get into house hacking because I wasn't, I wasn't in a place where I wanted to buy my forever home, but I also didn't want to live at home. So it kind of provided the balance of being able to house hack, having a non-committal housing situation that was still an investment where I didn't have to pay for um, for any expenses, essentially. Nice. So you're living in the the area, the the call the near southwest side. You, you know, was it Bridgeport was too expensive for you, or didn't want to put that type of money into a house hack? You know, why why, why Canaryville, or what brought you uh, neighborhoods out there? So very naively, I went on Zillow. I found my realtor, um, Susan Cochran. She's a great realtor in Bridgeport, um, at Canaryville, McKinley Park. And I'm like, look, Susan, I'm like, I don't have a lot of money. Um, I'm like, but I want to get involved in Bridgeport. Um, she's like, no worries. She's like, I'm from the area. Um, I want, you know, I'm okay looking at houses, you know, even if you're not going to, you know, buy them, you know, let's, let's walk through them. They add value to me as a realtor. Um, and that's one tip that I would probably give to some people. If you're just starting out, you know, being open with a realtor, you know, the first step is really walking through properties. You know, don't be afraid to go to a local realtor and be like, look, this is where I'm at. I want to start walking properties. And a lot of times they want to walk the same properties, you know, if they specialize in the area. So we went through about three properties and I soon figured out that I wasn't going to buy in Bridgeport. You know, we went through a gut rehab that a two, my very first one was a two flat, essentially a gut rehab for $350,000. I'm not handy, but it's, you can tell that you can put 150 grand in the building, you know, it was just too much for me. Um, You know, I went to another house and it was a two flat and it was kind of a turnkey property, you know, $350,000, maybe 375. And I walked through that and, you know, she's like, so what do you think? I'm like, I like it. And, you know, the most naive thing ever, you hear bigger pockets, low and no money down. She's like, so what's your idea on financing it? And this time I know nothing about the financing side. I'm like, oh, like you can do it low, no money down. Right. And she's like, no, 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 no. Like you need money. And that's when I first learned about closing costs, you know, so I went to the, so after that property, we looked at a couple more, but I essentially told her, I'm like, look, I need, uh, I need a few months to collect a little bit more money, um, get some more change in my pocket. So I at least had enough for, for closing costs. Yada, yada. Um, so that was my first kind of sense of knowing why Bridgeport wasn't going to work out. You know, I walked through a couple buildings and boom, I, it just was out of my budget. So the couple of nuggets I kind of take away from listeners, uh, you know, kind of understanding your limits, um, understanding that uh, a, a rehab that's going to be uh, that size, you're just not going to be capable of taking it down, nor are you comfortable taking it down. And the other one right, I took right. there is uh, making sure that uh, finance, you, you understand your financing options before you start looking at properties. Probably uh, if you could do it again, I imagine you would have went that route, right? Yeah, definitely. And that's where it kind of, um, and that's where my learning really started is after figuring out, okay, financing. And then I just started getting every bigger pockets book, you know, reading everything I can learning financing options. And, and then I went back to the drawing board and about three and three or four months later, um, just, I, I, I didn't stop looking at houses the whole time. That was the thing while I'm learning about it, like I'm still wanting to walk through properties. Um, so once I, I guess how I found this property is, uh, you know, Bridgeport is 
just like every neighborhood in Chicago in the last year, the market's just been crazy. You know, it's gone up by 15, 20%. Um, you know, Bridgeport, the numbers didn't work out in a house hacking situation there. Um, <clears throat> but I did find this one property that was south. Um, Canaryville is a, is a neighborhood that's just south of Bridgeport. It's one I didn't really give a, give a chance, but I never walked through it either. So there was just one property. It was a four unit. It was listed um, at 275. And when I went with my realtor to go look at the neighborhood, I was just pleasantly surprised. Um, new construction all over the place, new rehabs all over the place. Um, the neighborhood just seemed like that it was up and coming. Um, and outside of that, it was one of the only buildings in the area that I could afford. I wanted to stay close to the South side, just because my parents are on the Southwest side. That's kind of where my roots are. That's where I'm comfortable with. Um, and also it was a building that, um, it was a building that I could afford. Gotcha. Gotcha. One other thing I just want to pull out there, you continue to look at properties. I think looking at properties on paper, walking the outside, uh, or if you have a realtor that's willing to take you through, even if you're not prepared, then uh, I, I think there's a huge ongoing uh, experience education that you get from just looking at it. I remember when I got into this business uh, to learn the commercial side, I literally just was on LoopNet all day long looking at properties, trying to understand how to back into the numbers, how they got numbers and all that stuff. It's just a huge way to really understand the big picture. It, the biggest thing, just keep going. Right. It would have been so easy just to stop. <laughs> like you just keep every day, just keep going, keep going, keep going. It might take longer. You might be inefficient. You might make bad decisions, but just, just keep going. It'll, it'll, it'll work out. Yeah. 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 And I did the whole, I built my own um, calculator on Excel. You know, they have one on bigger pockets, but I definitely recommend anybody that's just getting started, build your own calculator. So you understand, you know, what ca gross cash flow is compared to not cash flow, you know, taking what the roof's going to cost to to repair in 15 years divided by your monthly payments and, and really understand what your budget is. Um, you know, that's something that I definitely recommend to a lot of people. Well, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say we have our uh, house hacking calculator on uh, straight up Chicago investor.com. So you combine that with a, a CapEx uh, breakdown. Uh, you, it's uh, definitely a great tool for all you guys looking at house hack. So, you, you, you find it, you had ultimately found this property. Uh, how long did it take you to, between the time you kind of saw this four flat, realize this is in your, uh, in your, your budget to actually write an offer and what was kind of going through your head in, in that time frame? Okay. So I sent it to my real estate agent friend, um, Kyle Markham. He's now out in San Diego. And I'm like, what do you think of this property? And he's like, yeah, Joe, he's like, it looks like a cash cow. You need to get an offer on this tomorrow. Um, so I call my realtor up. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I want to put an offer on it. And she's like, all right, here's my lender that I use. I call the lender. I was planning to put 10% down on the property. Uh, I call the lender and quickly they're like, yeah, because of COVID, we stopped doing 10% down, you know, mm -hmm. you need, you know, they, so I'm sitting there. I'm like, man, I'm just like, so I call like three more random mortgage lenders and they're all like, yep, we need at least 20% down. We got canceled due to COVID. So then my realtor's like, well, you can do an FHA 203K. And I'm like, okay, well, what's that? And she's like, well, that's where you can put three and a half percent down. And I'm like, okay, great. Let's do that. I don't know what it is, but let's get an offer in. The asking price was 275,000. I offered 275,000. I didn't get the property. They had about seven, um, they had about seven different offers. I was the first backup really bummed out. I remember it was about 10 to 14 days, you know, I'm, and they still didn't accept. They didn't, it didn't get contingent for a while. So I keep calling my realtor. I'm like, look, just touch base with their selling agent, you know, let them know that I'm serious. What's the update here. And it ends up that they couldn't, the original people didn't close on the property because some of the tenants didn't let them in the property due to COVID. So then there's me who I'm the second backup after about 14 days. They're like, you got your offer. I'm like, okay, this is sick. Like I'm on cloud nine. Um, we get to the property, you know, we, we go check it out. You know, I'm still running the numbers. 
my mortgage at 275, three and a half percent down is around 1900. Um, rents there, the gross rent is about 4,000. So I'm looking at all the units. They're rentable. They look pretty good. I'm no handyman, but you can tell they're rentable. And then there was one uh, tenant that didn't let me in. Um, and I counted that as a gut rehab. So all along, I'm just like, you know, whatever they're doing in there, whatever, why they're not letting us in, that's okay. I'll get them out. It's going to be a gut rehab. It still works if one unit's a gut rehab. Um, so we get to the property and we, we discover that it doesn't qualify for an FHA standard. So what your listeners should know about an FHA standard is that banks will not lend against distressed properties. You know, they usually want to lend 80 to, or, you know, 80% on the house's value. Um, the HUD created a program some time ago, an FHA program that, and it was designed for lower income people to get them into houses. And they said, look, we'll lend, we'll give you 96 and a half percent of the money as long as the house is in great condition, you know? So for houses that aren't in great condition, you can do an FHA 203K where you can put three and a half percent down and then they'll actually cover the cost of renovations to get it up to the FHA standard. So that's the route that we had to do just because the house wasn't in good enough shape for a traditional 203K. What was it specifically? Were, were there any two or three type uh, things that, that really knocked it out of being qualifying for the traditional one? Yeah, there was. Um, the gutters were half falling off. Um, the plumbing was out of code and, and the plumbing and electrical was out of code in the crawl space. And then in Chicago, it's a two, it was a four flat, but it was a two, um, two level. And they just redid the deck and the deck had an overhang that got taken out. So the siding was missing on, on a big portion of the house. Gotcha. What, what, uh, I don't know what your opinion is on this time, but, uh, Joey, what, what was your thinking when the tenant wasn't allowing access? Did any red flags go up at that point? Yeah, they definitely not. So definitely red flags, but my whole thought process was, you know, the, at this time, Mark, like all other in the direct neighborhood, there was four other four flats less than a block away that, um, Four other blo- four other four flats less than a block away that sold for over five hundred thousand. So I'm sitting here. I'm like, okay, I'm going to count it as gut rehab. Their lease ends in June. Um, even if they don't pay me another cent, as long as they move out by June, I'm going to come up on top. It's not like I'm going to be able to get anybody in there anyways, um, so they can stay. And my other thought process was, um, you know, I'm buying a house in the middle of COVID in one of the hardest cities in the country to own a house. And my thought was, if I could get through this and if I could solve these problems, I, uh, it's going to be a heck of an internship in my, in my real realtor career or real estate investment career. Gotcha. That's great. So we go through, talk through any, any hiccups with the 203k process. Cause we know there's a lot of red tape. It, pro- it provides a lot of, of flexibility in the fact that there's not a lot, not a good amount of money to put down, but anything is going through the process that was like, crap, I would have done this differently. Yeah. So uh, truth be told, I'm not done with the process. So my, uh, I'm actually starting renovations um, in two so it, to foreshadow what we're going to talk about, my tenants ended up squatting. It took me over nine to 10 months to get them out. Um, so I couldn't start renovations until they were out. Um, but I will talk about up until what happened. So if, you want, if you're looking at a building and, it quali- and you want to get a FHA 203K loan, um, what's going to happen is that your mortgage lender is going to work with the HUD inspector, with, which is a housing and urban development inspector. He's going to come out as a third party inspector and he's going to look at the house and he is going to mark down everything that is not up to an FHA standard, which is a huge, a huge, a a huge amount of information, you know? Um, So what he did is he came in and he audited the house and he created a scope of repair. And now it's my job before you have a certain time. Once he gives you, once he inspects the house, it's pretty much like, all right, you have 14 days to get 
a bid with the 203K qualified inspector to come bid on the repairs. And it needs to fall within the budget that the consultant um, provides. So, and, and that's where some of the red tape is where you can get to the point where your offer is contingently accepted. Um, but if the inspector says, okay, this is going to cost $35,000 to get it up to an FHA standard, you get three contractors to come in and say, okay, um, this is going to cost 45, 50 and 55, your, your deal essentially will die. Um, and then I guess another notable thing as well is that when you are doing an FHA 203K or an FHA on a house hack, it does have to meet certain criteria if the rents will cover the mortgage plus expenses, PI, MI plus a certain amount of expenses. Um, so even if I'm in Bridgeport doing an FHA, how FHA 203K, if the rents aren't going to cover a certain amount of the mortgage after, um, it might not work out, which is very possible. It happens all the time. Yeah. And I believe it's three, it does not account on two units, if I'm correct, right? It's three yeah. units and four units has the self-sufficiency test. Yeah, that's right. So you, you end up closing. What month was it you closed in? I closed in November. November 2020, correct? Yep, November okay. 2020. So you closed. Um, you're planning on uh, moving it. Was there a unit empty for you to move in? Uh, yeah. Is that so I, I moved into the building. Um, I'm in there for a few days. I'm with my, with my tenants. Um, couple days into it. So I guess I closed in November and my lease doesn't end until January. Right. So my first experience, um, and I guess my biggest takeaway from in real estate is if you're just getting started, get a mentor, like talk to somebody that knows more than you. Um, Mike Baker, who with second, um, second city developers is mine. Um, I'm going to bring him up a lot you know, the amount of phone calls that I made to him just being, you need somebody that you're going to be like, oh, you're going to be, you're going to want to call someone up and ask, what do I do now? So my first experience, I close on the house and that weekend I'm sitting on my couch in my apartment. I haven't moved in yet. And my neighbor calls me and she's like, Hey, the cops are at your apartment. I'm like, Oh, okay. And I like what's going on. And she's like, the tenants upstairs and the tenants downstairs are having a brawl. And I'm like, oh, nice. So I call Mike Baker and my mentor and I'm like, hey, Mike, I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, put your feet up and relax. You know what I mean? He's like, you know, he's like, there's nothing really you can do. And what I was thinking, I'm like, do I need to go down there? Do I need to get involved? You know, what do you do as a landlord? You know, um, so my first weekend, three days into it, I get my first, hey, the police are at your place. And I'm like, oh, great. Um, the tenant upstairs and the tenant downstairs, you know, got into a brawl. So, so I, I imagine you closed, you, you reached out to all the tenants all excitedly introducing yourself. Like how did yeah. those initial conversations go? Like, yeah, so I had a pre, a pre tenant meeting, um, or, a, a meeting with all my tenants. I, I, you know, got on Microsoft word, nice introduction to, of myself. Um, I also have to let them know, Hey, I am going to be renovating the building. I'm happy if you stay. Um, but I'm happy if you stay, if you know, you follow AK the rules, you know, and the rules were simple. Um, pick off your dog poop, no smoke in the apartments. Um, be courteous to your other tenants, really loose, really naive, to be honest. Um, so I had my pre-tenant meetings and one thing that I would not recommend from a FHA, if you're going to do a construction loan on a multifamily house, you're going to want the building empty. Okay. There's no, I, I don't see a and if or but situation where you're going to want to keep any tenants in there and try to do renovations around them. Um, and if they are in there, like I did, um, you're not going to want to tell them that you have a renovation loan. Um, one thing that I learned very early as a property manager is that um, you don't need to tell your tenants everything. You know, naively, I go in, I'm like, hey, here's what I'm doing. Here's my plans for the building. And my tenants, you know, on the south side of Chicago, they're savvy enough. And a lot of times they know property management and real estate landlord laws more than you do, you know. So by telling them all, all 
what my plans were for the building, they very early knew that um, I didn't have, they had me by the, you know what, you know, they, they had me by the, you know what. So was brawling on uh, your list of uh, rules for the building? No, no, okay, no brawling. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. So, so, um, and I did do my due diligence a little bit in terms of um, before I bought the building. You know, if you are taking over a normal multifamily building, you're going to want to get deposits. You're going to want to see proof of rent, proof of paying. Um, I got. I didn't take it far enough. I should have literally gotten like deposit slips, proof of deposits. The building owner told me, Oh, everybody's paying. Oh, here's the rent roll on a piece of paper. Everybody's up to date. And um, once I got in, I I found out really quickly that they weren't paying. Um, So, so you definitely want to take an extra step in and get proof of of payment. If you are taking over a multifamily building. Yep. So a lot of great points there, Joe. So we, we have the brawl. We, you, know, you call Mike, say, okay, well, let's sit back and relax. What, what walk us through next. So that, that, that calms down. What's our next little uh, hurdle that gets thrown at us? Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't, I, I did not address it. I didn't address it. Um, the next hurdle is I eventually move into the property. So January 1st comes around, I move all my things in there. Um, you know, I'm enthusiastic. I start painting my unit. Um, you know, my friend, um, is helping me. Um, you know, I'm in there for a few days and my friends come out and they're like, Hey, they're like, my car isn't there anymore. You know? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, my car isn't in front of your house anymore. Um, so I talked to all my tenants. I know one of my tenants had a, uh, a security camera. I'm like, Hey, can I have access to that? And she's like, no, you know, but the neighbor across the street has a great security camera. Um, she's like, you can go ask it for them. So I, I talked to the neighbor and I find out that the girl who sent me over there, her little brother stole my friend's car. So you guys were inside the unit doing uh, rehab work and he went out to go to his car and the car was gone. And ultimately it was the, uh, the tenant, uh, that, uh, their, their family member that, uh, that car jacked it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, how, would so, you do? So, would you, yeah. What happens now? <laughs> like yeah. I'll report, like what? So I find out and I, you know, I'm at the police station and, you know, I look at, and this is a part of property management where it's relationship management, um, where he's like, look, He's like, you could do one or two things. He's like, you can go and try to get your car back, you know, and not get the police involved, or you can get the police involved and, you know, you could be in for 20 years of getting your house ached, paintballed, you know, messed with, you know, um, Fuller Park, Bridgeport. It's one of those communities where everybody knows each other. Um, so a lot of, um, if there's an opportunity to solve an issue without police involvement, sometimes it's to your benefit. And, and in property management, I would probably, Mark, you might be able to, to comment, but th- that's something that maybe not just on the South side, but everywhere it might be beneficial is maybe the, you know, law enforcement isn't your first um, go-to if you know something illegal might be happening in your apartment. So that was the advice that uh, the Chicago police gave you, right? Is that, did you hear that right? Yeah. And All so right. I, I'm like, look, I'll, go, I'm like, I'll go up there, but I don't know these people, you know, I don't know what they're about. I'm like, can a police at least come with me? You know, I'm not trying to arrest them. I'm not, you know, whatever. So we go up there and the police, you know, didn't do a very good job in my opinion, but they, they did tell the, the tenant, they're like, look, they're like, if you, if the car spontaneously shows up tomorrow, all the, um, and we get a call the next day that it's in the middle of an alley, just sitting there. Um, so we ended up getting the car back. Um, and that it was, it was, it was upsetting, but, it is, you know, it is what it is. You know, we ended up getting the car back and it was almost like a, uh, it was almost like a silent apology from them. So they didn't know that it was our, my car. I highly doubt that they did. 
So how about those conversations going on in that apartment? Like, man, you sold the landlord, the, the new owner's car. <laughs> well, also you see, you live in the building, you see these people. Hey, how's so it going? did you sleep there that <laughs> night? Like, like you, you, that happens. Like, did you sleep there that night? Did you have doubts about living in that building? Like what was going through your mind at that point? Yeah. So I definitely had, um, definitely upset, definitely, you know, upset as anybody would be. Um, I stayed with my girlfriend at the time quite a bit after that, um, <laughs> you know, and the first part is, is, you know, it's also COVID where you can't evict people, you know, like evictions aren't going on. So you have to be strategic about how you're handling tenants during these times. Um, you know, sometimes. Uh, so, so what I ended up doing is I real, and to be fair, the, the guy that did it, he was about 16 years old. You know, so I'm not happy about it, but I also am not in the business to throw anybody in jail. I don't want to ruin someone's future. I ended up going to the house, you know, to them a few days later. And I'm just like, look, I know individually you guys didn't do it. And I'm like, but just stay, stay out of my business. Like, just don't let that happen again. Don't do that. You know, um, but it's COVID. And, and to be honest, there's not much you can do. And that's the worst part about it is there. And every two weeks you have the news playing, oh, no eviction, you know, new extended eviction moratorium, new extended eviction moratorium. Um, so it was pretty like, what if, what did I get myself into? That's crazy. Yeah. So you're probably talking to Mike, Mike Baker throughout all this, who great guy, you know, yep. cash for keys come up. Like, did you guys start talking some of these alternate strategies? Yeah. So I offered them cash for keys, but they were smart enough to know that they didn't, you know, he told me I, I talked, so they moved, it's a two bed, one bath and they moved over nine family members in there. Um, so I talked to the, to the dad and I'm just like, look, I'm like, I could offer you, um, X amount of money to leave, which was a generous amount. And he straight up told me, he's like, Joe, the realization is, is that we don't have where to go. Um, and if I accept these cash for keys, he straight up told me, he's like, I know I could stay here longer and it'll be much more valuable than what you're offering me. <sighs> so he basically said no. And he also told me, he's like, look, Joe, he's like, I've been evicted three or four times. He's like, I'm a professional at this. Oh, and geez. And so I'm like, all right. Um, at this point, at this point, it's a few months later, I start the eviction process. Um, Mark, you're the, um, you gave me Halstead Law Group, highly recommend them. So my lawyer's like, all right, this is what you need to do. You need to get all proof. You need to go down to the police station, get all police records. I go down to the police station and between November and March, they had the police called on them 12 times, <laughs> you know? So it was just a lot. I had videos of stealing the car. So I guess, um, I, Mark, you could tell me, is there an eviction moratorium in Illinois right now still? Um, there is uh, going on. It, it's, so there's a whole bunch of stuff with the CDC and, and it being overruled by the Supreme court and all that. But uh, so by the time it's there, I don't want to put anything kind of weird out there. So, so Okay. So just so you know, at this time, it's September 1st at the time and during COVID you couldn't evict for um, non-payment issues. Right. But yeah. you could evict if they were a danger to your building. So one day, you know, my third water bill comes in and it's substantially higher than, um, than what it should be, which tells me there's a leak. Right. So I'm just like, I have to handle this. I get, a plumber over there we're looking at the building and he's like hey he's like the leaks coming from the tenant that i'm having an issues with the apartment and so i knock on their door and of course they're not letting me in every time i've ever knocked on their door they're like hey we have covid like you're not coming here they've had covid 15 times um and she, like if you keep knocking on the door we're gonna call the police so I'm like, all right, like, so I ended up calling the police and the police come. I tell them what's going on. There's an emergency in the building. They're like, look, so the tenants are like, hey, like, we'll let the plumber in and only the plumber. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, I just want this fixed. The plumber fixes it and I leave. And about eight hours later of having a standoff with my tenants and um, I get a call from a neighbor and they're like, Hey, they're like, the ambulance is at your apartment. 
um, they're like, your tenant's mom OD'd in the apartment. And right then I realized that they weren't letting, and she's like, her arms are blue. She's been passed out for a while. Um, and I'm like, well, the reason why they weren't letting us in is because they had someone that was overdosed in the apartment the whole time. Um, well, the plumber was in there. Um, and in, so that was, and where I get to the eviction is that was my key where I'm like, okay, sweet. And then it had nothing to do with the overdose. It had everything to do with that. There was a leak in the apartment and they weren't, they were, they were not reporting it, nor were they letting me in. They were a damage. They were a cause of potential damage to my building. I could evict them, you know, um, they were causing harm. So I get with my lawyer and we end up going through the eviction process and they were smart because they kept extending the, the eviction court date. They knew what they were doing. And then the court where the date where the judge was going to rule them get evicted, she raises her hand. She's like, I'll be out in two weeks, you know? And so they made an agreement that if she's out in two weeks, that this will just get thrown out the window. So these tenants, they managed to, you know, they're just wild, you know, they're just wild. And, but they also, you know, they were smart enough. They stayed until the last possible moment without getting an eviction. And I give them credit a little bit. It, they were as calculated as I've ever seen. They, they were very calculated. I know should use that for good. <laughs> yeah. So you're about 10 months after closing. Um, what, what's the status of the four units now? And have you slept there one night after the car got stolen? Be honest. Uh, yes, I have. Um, yeah, so they're they're out. Um, so uh, once they left, I, I went in there and, um, you know, there was about a foot of trash in the building, which is not look, it's not a mark. You've taken over a lot of distressed buildings. This was a distressed unit within a building. You had about a foot of trash, um, hundreds of thousands of cockroaches. So um, I got everybody oh. I got everybody out of the building. My first step was get an exterminator in there. Um, so I got it exterminated. I had to, you know, I spent a whole day just cleaning the building, taking the shop back, cleaning up all the spider webs, um, sweeping up all these dead cockroaches. Um, they're coming over the exterminators coming over for round two and my renovation is scheduled to start in two weeks. So the whole place is empty now. I got one tenant living there. She's been there for over five years. Um, as she pays a week early. She's agreed to stay through the renovation. Um, I, you know, I've made arrangements with her in case the renovation doesn't go perfectly. Um, I decided to keep her in there. Three out of the four units are um, empty. So we're going to have to have you back uh, with a second part of this. <laughs> Tom, come on. What, are, what questions you got? I know you got something. Man, there's just so much there. Just, <laughs> first off, Joey, you, you you are stronger than the obstacles ahead of you, right? Yes. <laughs> so you take that as a silver lining. Like you, you you went through you went through a battle here, and it it gets easier. So, yeah. I guess just just talk through like this would scare a lot of people off, right? Any one of these little little things you mentioned would probably be like, "F this, I'm out, I'm running away." Are you still looking to buy? And and honestly, or do you are you on the sidelines for a little bit? Yeah, no, I am because it's lucrative. I mean, real estate, like when done right, is one of the most lucrative things I've ever seen. Um, right now, my focus is getting the building um, up to, you know, getting thing to stable. I will say stable, um, getting renters in there, get some cash flow going. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, ready to go. I mean, it, it sucks, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, it, I feel like I have a PhD in property management um relationship management um it networked me with a lot more people than um i thought it would um for example when you're on the south side of chicago you hear about you know the neighborhoods block to block well i met all my neighbors as a result you know all my neighbors are now part of my screening process for future tenants you know i have three neighbors that are raising their hand they're like hey put, put the applications in front of me i'll let you know if this person is good or bad if we know them um mike baker for example he also introduced me to an excellent plumber in the area um that is now you know that can do work at an affordable price 
he actually introduced me to an off county or an off um, to a Chicago police officer that on the side he issues eviction um, eviction notices. So you don't have to do it personally because it can get kind of dangerous. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I learned a lot. I learned a lot. That's awesome, man. So there's so many like, what would you do differently? But like, let's just pick one thing, like one thing out of out of this whole story where it's like, hey, that would have made this a smoother process. I would have gotten everybody out of the building before I bought it. Yep. Yep. Number one, don't. And it's a uh, number. That's it. Yeah. I think we've talked a lot about the risk, uh, especially this last year of taking on tenants and what truly the the risk value is of that. Um, so yeah, yep, I mean, it's good advice. Two quick comments there. Like I put a premium on vacant buildings, like we're talking about that. And two, like in your attorney review, just be buttoned up, right? Yep. Go ahead and ask for the world because it, I'm doing it right now. I'm selling, I'm selling a six unit. They're asking me a million questions and I'm like, well, good. They should be right. Like I, they should be asking me all these questions. Here's all the documentation. It's clean. But like they, they're doing a good job on the buy side to cover to cover their butts from you know five hundred different angles. Yeah, and, and you know when you're buying in you know Bridgeport, uh, Fuller Park area, Canaryville, McKinley Park, a lot of these uh, people and families they have families close by. They've been there for literally three or four generations. And I think in in life, like it's a small world. So even these um, even these tenants. I always treated them fairly even though, and to me, I always tried to do the right thing. Um, they, um, and a part of that is to make sure that if I have their respect, they're not going to throw a rock through my building once they moved out. Um, you know, so, and as a landlord, you guys can tell better than I can, even if they're not paying, you still actually have an obligation to take care of the buildings and make sure that their units inhabitable. You can't turn off the utilities. You can't force them out. If they say, hey, something's broken, you still have to fix it. And if you don't, they could call the police on you. They could sue you, you know. So that was a really that was a difficult part is when you're dealing with an eviction situation when they're like, hey, can you come um, can you come fix the electricity? The electricity went out. Well, it forced me to get to know the neighbors that, you know, came with me to do that to make sure everything was uh safe <laughs> yeah all right cool well that's uh that's, we got a lot here um that we took from today so um let's wrap this up here so i'm going to rephrase this first question a little um you know how what's your competitive advantage based on what you've gone through with this particular property so far um how is this going to uh shape the rest of your real estate investment career yeah. So one thing that I've realized, um, I almost have, I know the cost of what an eviction is, you know, when you're dealing with multi-units in Chicago, um, you're not only losing the rent from that unit, you're losing the rent from others affected by it, assuming that they want to move out. My competitive edge is I've learned, um, that if I might have a niche for taking over buildings with eviction situations in there, and I know the costs affiliated with them, so maybe in the future, I'm actually specialized and that's where I find my deals is taking over problem properties. Um, they don't scare me as much. Um, and awesome. you can get, I mean, my property, like the comps in the area, the lowest is 485. I mean, I bought my building at 275. So you, um, even with the loss of everything I've done, I'm still going. To get, um, but you also pay for your problems. And, you know, I did <laughs> a, a lot of soft costs in there that uh, we talked about here today. <laughs> so what's, yep. what's one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? Um, uh, you hear the take action part of it, but take action, get, start walking through buildings, um, start walking through buildings, network, go to your readers. But I would say for someone that hasn't bought a building yet, um, start walking properties. All right. What do you do for fun? Yeah. I mean, for fun, I, uh, man, three, this property's really consumed my life for the last year. So I haven't had that, you know, for fun. I like to exercise. I like to hang out with friends. Um, you know, I'm your average 27 year old. I like 
going to the bar with some buddies. I like taking my dog for a walk. Um, I played volleyball in college, so I like playing beach volleyball on Tuesday nights. Um, you know, if, if, it was, if it was my friends at, at a building and their car got stolen, they would totally think it was me just because that would be a joke I would play on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, We've done that. If someone's been too drunk to drive and there's a sober person there, we'll move the car in the morning. Yep. yep. <laughs> just to mess with them. <laughs> we do that to people here in the office. We move the car to the next yeah. parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Joe, what's a good book, podcast, or self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners? Um. You know, all the bigger pocket stuff is really good. Um, I really liked um, Vivid Vision. I don't know if either of you guys read it. Um, I have a whiteboard in my apartment, and I actually I wrote my Vivid Vision out. Um, I also drew a picture of it, which is kind of weird. But I started off with a uh, with a bridge, and at one side of the bridge is this four unit building, and then on the other side of that bridge is you know my long term goals. And, you know, what does building that bridge look like to get to that long-term goal? And, you know, vision, vivid vision kind of inspired me to do that. Awesome. Nice. Uh, Besides yourself, name one person in your local network you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Uh, Mike Baker. Uh, I saw that coming. Yeah. I mean, Mike Baker and also having, uh, having friends around your age that do it, like getting out. <clears throat> I met my good friend Connor and, and Jay, um, on bigger pockets. They're kind of around the same stage as I am there have, you know, so having that kind of support and let's be honest, when you're in real estate, you know, your significant other doesn't always want to talk about it. Your friends don't always want to hear about it. So getting, uh, getting friends that you're, that enjoy just, um, casually talking about real estate's beneficial. I love it. Yep. All right, Joe, thanks so much. This has provided a ton of value, a ton of entertainment. How can our listeners learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Yeah. So you could find me on Instagram at, um, at REI Joey, REI Joey. <clears throat> um, in terms of, adding value to others, anybody, you know, if you reach out to me on there, I'm happy to um, give you any advice on the 203k process, um, buying your first property, having phone calls on property management, um, connecting you with someone that can be a resource if I'm not it. Um, So definitely my Instagram is going to be the best way to reach me. Awesome. Awesome. We will link to all that in the show notes. Yep. All right. So Mark, all right. I'll give you multiple choice again on this one. We mentioned we, we have a carjacking in this episode. So uh, in preparation for that, I looked up, there were this, this many uh, stolen cars and carjackings in Chicago in 2020. Is the answer a 1,150 B 3,421 C 9,599 or D 14,581. Oh man. I had no. no idea on this one. Like I didn't have any idea of magnitude. I, I would have said B cause that just seemed that, you know, I imagine a lot of them don't even get reported even too. So B. So you're going 30, the 3,400 number. Yeah. Joey, what do you want to go with? Well, I'll tell you this after that happened, I found an interesting fact that recently in Chicago that they made carjackings. You can't hold somebody on bond for a carjacking. So one of the reasons why they went up is because you can go steal an $80,000 car, get caught, get out of jail that day, not have to, you know, the car is gone and you just made a huge profit. So a lot, whatever the big number is, 14,000, I'm going. <laughs> Man, I did not know that. You, you've got to split the middle there, guys. It's C, the 9,599. Gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's a lot of carjacking. That's a huge number per capita. Like, wow, that's crazy. All right. Uh, you leave me in astonishment uh, going out with that. So Joey, awesome show. Tom, thanks as always. Uh, we spoke about it today here, the house hacking calculator on, G- on straightupchicagoinvestor.com. Uh, go ahead and download it. It's an awesome tool. Um, we also have links to other um, uh, calculators on there. We have the rent versus uh, sell. So if you're contemplating, should I sell a property I have or should I flip it or should I hold it? It's an awesome calculator that runs out your, your 5, 10, uh, 15 year outlook on what you'd make, keep it as a rental versus what you might make flipping it. So check that out. Um, don't forget to leave us a review. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Joey. Yep. Have a good one. Thanks, all. Right,